trying to get back to the basics of great products. Power comes from sharing information. I try to convince people to slow down. Free. Yeah. Open. This is the Soak Tyson Podcast. Before we go to the episode, here's a quick word from our sponsor, CapChase. Imagine that you could get access to the revenues you'll generate in the next 12 months already today. What would it mean for you? CapChase helps fast-growing recurring revenue companies finance growth without taking on debt or dilution. Whether you want to invest in growth or R&D, CapChase turns your predictable revenue into growth capital today. CapChase has helped founders unlock hundreds of millions in financing to fuel their growth and on average extend their runway by eight months and spared upwards of 16% dilution. So go see how insanely easy it is by clicking the link in the show notes or go to capchase.com slash slush to learn more. Thanks. Let's go to the episode. Hi, welcome to this week's episode of Soaked by Slush. My name is Isak Rautio and next to me is Ona. Hi, Ona. Hi, everyone. Nice to be here. And as our special guests for this episode uh, from SoftBank, uh, Anthony Dowey and Nahoko Hishono, welcome to the Soak by Slush podcast. Great. Nice to connect, guys. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you. you. Good to see you. Really nice to meet you both. Would you like to give a short introduction of uh, who you are? Yeah, sure. So um, Anthony Dowey, I'm a partner with SoftBank Vision Fund uh, based based in London. Um, we're, we're late stage growth equity investors uh, and uh, look forward to the discussion today. Okay. Yes, I'm Nahoko Hoshino. I'm a director of the fund. Uh, also sit with Anthony at the London office. Um, I've been with the fund for a bit more than two and a half years looking at various industries and it's been a blast so far. I think that's an understatement. It's been a very exciting two and a half years. So great to be here. Thank you. It's awesome to have you. Yes, likewise. Um, so uh, the Vision Fund, Softback Vision Fund, in 2017, the biggest uh, in the world of its kind. And now there's been a few years and you're already at the second round of it. What has changed? What, how are you sort of approaching this, this the second fund uh, at this time? Uh, sure, ha- happy to kick off. Uh, so we believe in really evolution rather than revolution. So our second fund, which is currently capitalized at 40 billion as compared to the first fund of 100, the approach is pretty similar. We are looking for market leading companies backed by best in class management teams and founder led and uh, underpinned by AI and big data and disrupting the world, uh, disrupting traditional industries through those characteristics So market leadership underpinned by AI and big data. The characteristics of the companies we're looking for are exactly the same, fund two versus fund one. The biggest change has probably been that we're somewhat more diversified uh, in the second fund, and we've we've therefore written, on average, slightly smaller checks. Uh, So I think in our first fund, we did uh, 90 or, or so investments, and we've invested 90 or so of the 100 billion the remaining 10 being reserved for follow-ons of existing portfolio companies. And in the second fund, which is 40 billion um, thus far, we've invested in about 180 companies. So the average check size is smaller, there's greater diversification. We have the ability to to write slightly smaller minimum checks, Uh, but the range is still pretty broad. So we've done, we've gone from 20 and 30 million checks to to $3 billion checks in, in our second fund. Great. Do you want to talk a little bit about the diversification of the second fund? So um, is it is it different industries, different geographical um, points? How has the second fund been different in that sense than the first fund? Now, Hoko, do you want to take this one? Um, sure. So just because we're writing smaller checks and approaching companies at an earlier stage, it doesn't really change anything about the investment uh, philosophy of ours. So the process is entirely the same. In terms of diversity, in terms of regions, because we are a bigger team now, I mean, when the fund started, we were only a handful of us. And now we are, our investment team is more than 20 people. So we can cover a range of industries. And also in terms of region, now we are in the 
the Nordics, the Baltics, more in the Middle East, including Israel. So we have a bit more uh, bandwidth. Um, but in terms of investments, whether we're looking for a Series A or a Series F or even later, you know, primarily we're looking for just three things. Um, one is the, the market opportunity, um, a huge town that has opportunity for a new leader to emerge. And that product must be transcendable across borders. So fast growth. Um, and then secondly, it's the, the business or the product fit. Um, we're looking for a product that is driven by tech and leverages the AI and data. Um, it needs to be a scalable business model. And it solves the, the consumer's pain point on a day-to-day -day basis. And I guess lastly, but most importantly, we invest in the people. So really, we're really excited about meeting all these founders who have a very clear vision, who are fearless, um, and they're very execution-minded. And just they spend the majority of their time thinking about how to embed in, uh, better the, the customer experience. So those are basically the things that we're looking for. Unfortunately, we've been investing in companies that become unicorns, and then unicorns into decacorns. Um, it's just a very uh, great way to, to, I guess, join the journey earlier on. And just to add uh, on the point about geographic diversification, so Nahoka was talking about our breadth within the European region. As a global matter, we invest everywhere in the world from North America, China, India, Middle East, Europe. But one noticeable trend in our second fund is that we've invested a lot more proportionately in Europe. And that's been a function of the real uh, explosion of the quality of companies in Europe that we've seen, particularly in the last 12 months, especially across all of those different regions as Europe, of Europe, as Naoka was explaining. So I think in our second fund, we, we've done around 40 investments in Europe as compared to less than 10 in our first fund. And so I think by number of companies, more than 20% of our second fund are in Europe and more than 30% of the capital is in Europe, which is a significant increase compared to our first fund. That's really interesting. Yes, it is. Yeah, Europe is an interesting topic. We're probably going to get to Europe a bit later here in this episode. There's a lot to uh, say there. I'm still uh, like asking about the same question a little bit that Orna was uh, getting at uh, about the different process. I know, Nahoko, you said that not much has changed, but I guess intuitively, if you if I uh, compare late stage to early stage, like you are missing a certain amount of track record of the companies that you are investing in. And that is ki kind of, um, that is in, it's an, almost an obvious difference. So does that difference in track record make the assessment process different? What, what are you looking at and how do you evaluate? Yeah, I'm happy to comment here. So um, I think it's really important for, for us to clarify that we are not early stage investors. Right. So when we talk about investing earlier stage, what we mean is that we have the ability to write slight, slightly smaller checks. And that may mean that we can get into possibly one round earlier a company than we otherwise would. But we, we very much are not seed Series A conventional investors. We're not investing in companies that have a limited track record uh, or that, that are still experimenting with their product and their go-to-market strategy. So this is what we mean when we say that our, our investment strategy and philosophy is exactly the same in our second fund as our first fund. We will only invest in companies where they have a clear product market fit unit economics that are demonstrable, return on growth capital that's demonstrable. And most of the time, that means that they've raised capital in the past. They've deployed it, successfully demonstrated that the return on, on that capital, and therefore with confidence, can invest more capital uh, in the future. And the, the other real, really important characteristic for us is that it's a market leader. And that we're seeing in these little niches, just take a step back. Why do, we, why do we think AI and data is important? It's because AI and data will fundamentally disrupt every industry in the world. And that's also why we're sector agnostic, because we look for that characteristic in any sector where a tech company underpinned by AI and data can disrupt those traditional players in the traditional industry and create a new disruptive, amazing product or service for its customers. And so... If you think about what we're looking for is those market leadership players, again, it cannot be too early in its life cycle or you wouldn't know that that company is already a leader. It just so happens that sometimes you can now see that leadership characteristic when a company could be in its Series B, could be in its Series C, it could be, a, it could be that it, it only needs 20, 30, 50 million 
for its next phase of growth, but you still can see already that that company is going to be a big leader. It's, it's, com it's completely different from being a venture investor who, who comes in at the very early stage of a company when they're experimenting. Right. Definitely. Um, continuing on that, are there some certain milestones that you see are critical or every company must have before you are ready to invest in them? So what kind of Uh, meters or milestones show that the company has progressed well and is able to scale fast. Yeah, Nahoka, do you want to start on? Sure. I mean, I I think I'll just be re reiterating what I just said earlier. It really is the right you know market product fit. Um, and the founder, because we have a lot of dialogue with the founder just to understand how they have come to starting the company, you know, what their journey has been so far and how they think about how they grow the company. So that's really what we're looking for. But I think what makes us really unique is, I um, mean, Masa, our founder, is, is a guy who really thinks big. He wants to see uh, 30 years ahead where the company is going, you know, not, not just growing 100% year on year for just two years, but a longer period of time. So we want to see the scalability in the, in the, in the business And whether or not we can see that, I think is a big um, determining point whether we're making an investment or not. Um, but everything else, I think, will be just repeating ourselves. I think um, we tend to avoid having specific milestones of you need X amount of revenue or you need to have been around X amount of years or whatever it is. But what we want to see is that clear path to being a leader in a space that has a large town and therefore can be a large company Uh, over time. So if you take the combination of a management team that's built a quality company that's winning in the market, unit economics, like gross margins, for example, that are demonstrable across their existing revenue base or their, their contracted customers, and then return on growth capital, which I talked about earlier. So LTB CAC, for example, where they've spent money in the past, gathered customers as a, res as a result of that investment, and that you can see that further capital invested in, in growth will yield similar results. There's a pretty clear path then to a company that, that can be a, a winner over time. Great. So we can jump to Europe now. Uh, you already, Anthony, you already um, said an opening word about Europe, but I guess sort of generally just what is, why is it more attractive now? Why is it, uh, or is it? it? It absolutely is. It's amazing what's happened in, in the last 12 months. And it, I'm not, I can't quite figure out if this has been a direct benefit from the pandemic or just a coincidence. I mean, certainly the, the tech industry has been fired up by the, the constraints that the, that the pandemic placed on everybody and therefore the requirement for solutions to address those challenges. And um, that's, I, I don't know if that's kind of a direct or indirect, we just randomly happened at the same time. I, I think the, the really big change in Europe has been the quality and breadth of the companies has gone up. So what does that mean is that if, if we look two or three years ago at investments in Europe, they may have been small companies, maybe valued at one, 200 million, maybe looking to raise 10, 20, 30 million. And that was small by our standards, particularly when you look at the, the opportunities and the scale of the companies in the US, China, and elsewhere in the world. And that's dynamic, you know, dramatically changed in the last 12 months. You've got bigger companies, bigger ambitions. Probably the biggest change has been the mindset of the entrepreneurs in that they're willing to raise more equity, take more risk, invest in growth, and have the confidence that that investment in growth is going to be successful. And we've also seen this fantastic track record over the last year or two where they really have demonstrated that success. So we're seeing breakout of these companies, both within the region, And that can be in its own country in Europe. It could be across multiple jurisdictions in Europe, which is a, it's a difficult thing to achieve. And it's something that European companies have distinct from maybe American companies where going across multiple EU jurisdictions or the UK, EU and other markets in the region is very difficult to do. If you can do it, it's a real barrier to entry and a, and a powerful skill that you can then leverage abroad. But it, it also can be European companies selling their products in North America, in Asia, and in other markets around the world. And so I think that the single biggest step change has been that the entrepreneur mindset, the confidence that they have to go to market to raise growth capital 
and pursue growth, which of course is what our counterparts in North America have been doing for a long time and, and other regions around the world ca- catch up. But the amazing thing that happens on the back of that is you see this great track record, you see this growth, this equity value creation, this revenue growth, this market penetration of tech companies versus traditional industries, and so more capital is also flowing to the region. So we got investors from around the world who now want to invest in Europe. That reinforces the confidence further of the companies, the entrepreneurs to invest behind that that, that trend, and, and you get a virtuous cycle of capital and growth reinforcing each other. Yeah, I, w- I would definitely add to that. I mean, I, I, I think it really is the ecosystem developing um, so quickly over the last 12 months, so much capital that has been drawn into the region that creates, I guess, a, a nice playground for these founders to, to try out their new ideas, you know, speaking with uh, venture capitalists. It's, it's just becoming a very normal thing. And that's what I think Anthony was alluding to as a virtuous cycle. Um, there's just so much activity that you see bit more competition, but then I think that adds um, a lot of positive value to the ecosystem. So you can you can definitely see that um, change in terms of uh, dynamics, market dynamics, but also what that helps is um, also talent development. It was only in London and Berlin, some of the, the tech hubs um, that were notable in Europe, but then now we have many more in different regions. And I think that just you know, reinforces the development of the ecosystem altogether. So yes, we're definitely feeling it um, very recently. Talking more about European founders, there's been a lot of talk about these, some bigger companies such as Spotify or Klarna, uh, kind of mushrooming into new companies that the sea level or other talent from these earlier success stories uh, are kind of the new founders of uh, European future unicorns and so on. Have you seen this in in your uh, investment or your deal flow? Or is it usually still first-time founders or people coming from very different backgrounds uh, that tend to found the companies? Look, I think it's a, I, I think it's a mix. I mean, there are some first-time founders who are very successful. There are the companies where the founders have have extensive career backgrounds and have, have founded a great company. I think there's no no specific trend. I think that probably the difference for us is because we don't come in right after they founded the company, we are less sensitive to whether they're a first-time founder or a serial founder than, than maybe an earlier stage investor would be. Uh, you've mentioned mindset a few times, confidence, these things that... I guess you could call intangibles, but they are still very, very tangible. I, I guess it's it's they're they're the source of a lot of the action that 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 happens within a company. Can you speak a bit more about that? Uh, what do you mean by it? How do you how do you assess that? How you how do you notice that? What's your what's what's your thinking about mindset and how you approach that? Okay, do you want to comment? No, go ahead, Anthony. I'm trying to think about all the founders I've been. It is a difficult. With. It is a trickily phrased question. I, I admit, but like, uh, but I guess the gist of it is, uh, if if you make an assessment according to someone's mindset, I guess, I guess the sort of eye to eye moment or, or or sort of reading between the lines, as it were, uh, what is that like? How how would you approach that, or how do you approach that? Yeah. So, so look, I think there's always a a, a whole kind of cocktail of ingredients or factors that you have to consider in whether you, you believe in and want to invest in a company. Mm-hmm. And the just the entrepreneur, the founders, the management organization they built around them, the sense of momentum in their business, the amount of human capital they've attracted, all of these things are, yes, somewhat intangible factors that that just through experience you build up a feel for and you have a sense of whether a company is on the right track but i think you would never make an investment decision based on that set of factors alone it always comes alongside what's the track record of the company what's their historical revenue trajectory what kind of go-to-market strategy have they employed what what have they done to differentiate their product versus others in the market have they developed unique technology that is differentiated and what, what have they done in terms of the team 
the software engineers or whatever team constituents of them to, to build that up? Is it a particular expertise the founders themselves have or is it the tech expertise they've built? So th there's so much around, um, you know, the company track record that comes along with the founder and their mindset. And then, of course, what we really care about is the future. And so we look into the business plan. We we understand what the growth potential of the company is, the, the, the total addressable market, the share of that market they're looking to take, and how they're going to you know to take that share in, in light of the competitive environment. Right? And that could be traditional players in their industries, or it could be other technology disruptors that that are you know playing the same game to to, to break into the market. And so what we really care about is the future. And that's where often the sky's the limit. If the founders can think about how much capital is the right amount to raise, what do they use it for? How do they do that in a, in a disciplined and controlled way to, to drive high growth, but also with, with um, sensible amounts of execution risk? And then, of course, what we try to understand is package that all together and form an underwriting case as, as to whether we think the growth that they can deliver in light of the risks that they face is going to deliver us attractive uh, risk-adjusted returns. Like you said, uh, it's a kind of a multitude of things uh, that needs need to be correct uh, for, for you to invest. Um, but the chemistry between investor and founder is really important as well because it's a, it's a long alliance. In many countries, that uh, relationship can be even longer than an average marriage. So it's really important to have like a good <laughs> chemistry with your partner, or with your investor or founder. But there's is, been that a Helsinki, is that a Helsinki thing? Or? In Finland, <laughs> at least that's the record. <laughs> but um, so if that's so important, there's been also this kind of issue highlighted that often investors maybe look for founders that are similar than themselves. And there's other biases going around as well. Um, have you sought to address that issue, and if so, how? Yeah, look, I think the um, the relationship, the, the chemistry between investors and founders is critical. There are pl there are plenty of investors in the market. There are plenty of capital alternatives that these companies have, and uh, and I think in order to bring you on board, they first of all have to like and get on with you as individuals. So the the rapport as t as a team that you build as individuals with the company is important. Of course, we represent SoftBank. Our institutional brand is strong. And that's something that founders may find attractive, but they're not going to they're not going to take your capital versus others if they don't have a strong dynamic with you as individuals. I think what what they're usually looking for is that mentorship, that guidance, the, the sense that you're going to help them in the journey. And then maybe there's some other things you can bring to the table, whether it's connecting them with the rest of our ecosystem, whether it's helping them on their path to capital markets can be many, many things that that we could help founders with. But the really important thing is for us to support them in their growth um, and, and let, let the management be the drivers and, and us to be in the background um, guiding, supporting, and helping where we can. But the stars of the show are really the management team. Yeah, I agree. I think, yeah, no, I think I agree. I mean, we're definitely the cheerleaders, not, not really the coach. Um, of, of the basketball team. But I mean, I think in terms of those the bias um, issue that you raised, it, it's absolutely right. You tend to connect better. You have better chemistry with people who have very similar backgrounds to you. And we try to be conscious about it, but it's, it's very natural. So I think what we try to do at least um, from, from very minimum is, I mean, our team is very diverse. We come from all different backgrounds. We represent, I guess, different Um, ethnic groups as well. So we try to have a bit more openness in terms of um, understanding founders and their backgrounds. So I think that's one. Um, us being a cheerleader, that means we are the support group. And um, as Anthony said, we are a huge organization. You know, we our organization of the software group, it stems from, you know, Japan and then to the US, have people from all sorts of, uh, I guess, different functions. So when the founder or the, the management team in general, they need anything, we are there to help and connect them to the right people in our ecosystem. And I mean, we, we try to do that on a daily basis. You know, we're later stage investors, but as much as we could, um, we are patient. And I think it's, you know, one of the, the key selling points is that we are not pressured 
to return capital immediately, we can be a bit more patient in time. We can be longer term investors. So, you know, we try to work along with founders and the, the exec team and try to find what is the right path for them at the right point um, in their time. So that's what we try to do. There's a, uh... There's records of massive capital going on, venture capital actually going around, going around right now. Uh, sorry for that mess of a sentence. Um, how is it competitive? Is it more difficult to get into rounds now uh, these days? And how does it show in your in your uh, work? Yeah, so I talked a little bit about this trend earlier on, which is we've seen more capital attracted to Europe, for example, because the region's become a more attractive investment area. And um, we, we actually see that as a pretty positive trend on, on the whole because there are more investment opportunities that are available at the scale and growth that we, that we seek and with arguably better risk-adjusted risk returns or growth profiles. And therefore, the more capital but better quality in, in opportunities and therefore net-net that, that there's enough good quality investment opportunities to go around. So yes, there is, there, there is more competition in the sense that there may be more investors around any given situation. We tend to see different investors each time. Sometimes it's competitive, sometimes it's not. Sometimes there are plenty of interested parties, but they clearly prefer you. Sometimes they might prefer someone else. That, but overall, we see an abundance of quality opportunities, much stronger than we saw in Europe, let's say two or three years ago, when arguably there were much fewer investors in the region. So you, you go back a few years, we might've been the only investor, but there were very few opportunities to invest in European companies at the scale we were looking to invest. Now, now there's vastly more opportunities. And yes, there are more investors, but net net, there are still many more where we get the opportunity to invest that have the, the favorable risk adjusted returns that we look for. So I think that the the market's in a good place. There's de definitely not a, an overwhelming number of investors that, that are making it too competitive. Um, maybe continue on that kind of down the road. Um, when companies grow and you look for the next funding stage, um, there's always options. There's the next growth funding, there's an exit and there's an IPO at least. Um, how do you define which is the right path for the company. Of course, the founders are defining it themselves, but how do you dis support them in this process? And how do you guide them uh, finding their way onto the next stage? I can comment on that. I guess that's an interesting question because, I mean, it's true that quite a few of our portfolio companies are deciding to uh, go for the SPAC or the IPO route recently. Um, but we can only say that's really case by case. Each company is very different. Each company has own reasons and, and benefits of uh, becoming a, a public company. Um, and, you know, maybe for a consumer company, it's the, the publicity or the brand awareness that they're going after. And maybe for some enterprise companies, they want the credibility being a public listed company. So what we try to do, I mean, we always come in as minority investor, and it's really up to the, the founder and the board to decide when is the right time to exit or go public. Um, but we try to just be with them um, to figure out what the right strategy is at the right point. And if an IPO is not the right path for them at a, a specific point in time, that's totally fine. If there's a need for additional capital, we try to provide that for them. Um, so there's no, there's really no pressure from our end, but I think a good example will be Alibaba, where uh, Masa invested in them in 1999, and they went public only in 2014. So it took 15 years for the investment to materialize. Um, but if it makes sense for the company to stay private for that long, it's totally fine. Um, we don't need to return capital because we're investing our own funds and we can afford to be patient and wait. So it's really is case by case. Yeah, I think um, just, just to add a, a little bit to what Nahoko said, um, it's a big decision for any company to go public and that could be an IPO, it could be a SPAC or a direct listing. The most important thing is for the company to go public when it's actually ready to do that. And I think 
when you see that that great event of an IPO, um, you know, give a couple of examples in, in Europe this year. We IPO Auto Store, a warehouse automation business uh, out of uh, Norway earlier this week. Uh, very successful event. We IPO Auto One, uh, the German used car trading platform on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange earlier in the year. And these are companies that have really built a great path to a public exit, to um, when I say an exit, having a liquid currency that their employees can take advantage of, that crystallizes some, some liquid value for the, those employees who, who work tirelessly over the years to, with their equity to, to build those, those phenomenal, uh, in the case of, you know, kind of unicorns and decacorns, great example, because auto store is a decacorn um, and, and auto one's not far off. So, you know, phenomenal events for the company, for their employees, can, can in some cases, it can be an advantage because you have currency for m a it can provide you with a lot of capital, you know, auto one raised a billion dollars. And where there are others in the market who may be private, who may not be able to raise that amount of money to fund growth, that can be a strategic advantage. So there are many reasons why going public can be a good thing. But what's critical is that the company is ready for it. So both of those companies have been preparing for years and we're absolutely in, in the right stage to, to be a public company. I think for companies that are not ready, it becomes a distraction. You get you have to report quarterly or biannual learnings. The market focuses on that. It may compromise your strategic long-term planning. And you know, if, the, if your results don't go the right way, you'll be under pressure and it could derail uh, the, the otherwise strong strategic progress of the company. So, so we, uh, as patient investors, exactly as Mahopo said, we're there for the company to go public or find whatever form of solution that, that, that may be suitable for them whenever is the time for that company. So it's, it's not us, the investors, who are dictating uh, the pace of what the company does. Now, it's always interesting to ask investors what future industries, technologies, et cetera, are on the rise in the future. Uh, if we pick like a five-year time scale, what do you think? I, uh, Anthony, you touched on this a bit earlier. You said data, I'm paraphrasing here, data and machine learning will change everything. Like, will it even change sl- uh, sliced bread? What do you think? Like everything, will, will everything change uh, with data and AI? What, what technologies do you see are on the rise? Yeah, look, um, I don't know about the slice of bread, but there definitely are some some interesting companies doing things like vertical farming, food tech, ag tech, etc. Um, you know, more environmental ways of producing food, etc. So that that is a big industry for sure. I think um, you know necessarily there are some things in the physical world like a real estate building is a real estate building, right? That you know, there are physical things, and there are there are um, product services which, which exist in the digital realm. And, and so, what we're really talking about is how the digital realm supports the physical realm, right? Or the digital realm in and of itself. And that digital realm has just exploded. If you if you you know you kind of walk back across the technology, the first thing that that made a big difference was the internet, you know, telecoms and the internet. And, and that was the, you know, the earlier waves of soft bank groups investment through the eighties, the nineties and the two thousands was around telecoms, which created the infrastructure for the internet to exist, mobile phones to exist. And then the rollout of the internet and the speed of the internet getting faster that enabled the services. I mean, if you had a AOL dial up, um, internet in the 1990s, you wouldn't be able to do this call. It wouldn't work. You wouldn't be able to, you know, you barely would be able to send an email. You wouldn't that you wouldn't be able to use certainly your, you know, your Instagram or your YouTube or your Facebook, whatever it may be. And so first the rails had to be created that enabled all of these amazing services to run on top of it. And then we had the smartphone, which came in, I'm going to say 15 years ago, but I think it was maybe even more recent than that. But you, you can't imagine the life now with, you know, before the iPhone even existed, right? So we had first the iPod, then we had the iPhone. And as the smartphone has got more powerful, the, the breadth of services and the, the amount that amazing things it's provided to consumers and businesses who, who, who can just do fundamentally different things, whether it's finance, whether it's health tech, whether it's hailing an Uber, 
you know, rather than having to hail a taxi on the street and, and you name it, running your banking on Revolut, whatever it may be. There are businesses the same. The, the amount of just change, disruption, quality of service, quality of life that things can, people can do either for free or at a much lower and affordable cost than, than was imaginable previously. And, and, and then you've had on top of that the more recent wave, which is AI data and machine learning is really maximizing, optimizing the quality of those businesses that can run on those rails. And the really amazing thing is that as you gather more data, you can always optimize what you do. You can optimize the service you're providing to businesses, consumers. Uh, as a result of more and more data, and then the computers themselves running the algorithm to compute how to you know how to analyze the data better and make you know make uh, superior calculations on the future inputs to that, and and that's really what machine learning is all about. So that is we see infusing pretty much every industry, because whoever you talk to, and that could be also companies in the traditional sphere, right? Large listed Fortune 500 companies, FTSE companies are also implementing data and machine learning into their practices. It just so happens that it's a smaller part of their businesses, whereas the younger disruptors can have it at the heart of what they do. And that often allows them to do things fundamentally differently. So I just actually looked it up. It's 14 years and four months ago. That was right on the money, Anthony, there. <laughs> First iPhone. Very good guess. <laughs> Uh, yes. <laughs> That's brilliant. Yeah. What would you have guessed, guys? Longer um, or shorter? I would have said shorter, I, I must say. I would have said like 12 years, maybe 13 years. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I should I have said I should. I would have said fourteen months. I have. I had all the. I could have been dishonest here and just made myself look better. But no. <laughs> yeah. What do you think? What, what would you have gone with, Anna? I think a little bit less as well. Yeah. yeah. But around that time. But it, that was a great guess. Yeah. Hey, this has been a pleasure. Thank you so much. This has been yeah really interesting to hear because Softbank is of course such a big player in the field and. Uh, what you decide and where you go, the industry shifts towards as well. So it's been really interesting to hear how you how you see the development and interesting to hear that Europe is really growing. Yeah, we're very excited, um, you know, about in Europe in particular, but, but also globally, the amount of innovation that's going on in tech. I think that improved environment and the quality of companies that are being fueled by this AI and data theme is is a global phenomenon. So around the world, we're seeing seeing great opportunities, and we're very uh, positive and excited about the future. Yeah, we're very committed in Europe, and and thanks for the very interesting questions. You know, some of those never really thought about, but you know, very definitely food for thoughts. And yes, it's good to know that everyone's very committed to this region. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nahoko and uh, Anthony. And thanks uh, for listening to this episode. Uh, remember to comment, uh, l subscribe, like all these things, uh, whether or not you're watching this on YouTube or listening just on Spotify or all the podcast apps. Uh, we'll see you later next week. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.